I'm going to do my best to uh, convince you that I have the wealth of data on my side and that exitinib is the uh, standard of care in second line metastatic RCC. So here's the background. As you know, targeted therapy has largely been developed in a, either a treatment naive or perhaps a cytokine refractory population, which is less common today. Of course, in the real world, we all have lots of patients who progress on initial therapy and are, are suitable for a second line therapy. And therefore, many of our clinical treatment decisions uh, are based, are, are in this second line setting. And there's really, uh, to date, historically, been little solid data to guide these decisions. What I've found when I go out and talk with at least the community physicians in the U.S. is that many physicians like to change mechanisms after initial failure of uh, veg VEGF therapy. And this logic presumes that kidney cancer somehow changes from fundamentally reliant on VEGF, which I think many of us believe, uh, uh, at the initial time of initial therapy, to a predominant reliance on mTOR at the time of VEGF resistance. And there's no data, to, to my knowledge, that would uh, support that. So I'm I hope to convince you over the course of the next 10 minutes that the reality is that the preclinical and clinical data support that there is persistent uh, VEGF reliance in kidney cancer and thus persistent sensitivity to VEGF targeted approaches. So here's a, a cartoon from a review that uh, Mike Atkins and I wrote a few years ago now and uh, James Larkin gave a very nice talk about resistance yesterday. So I won't uh, recapitulate that, but this is really just to say that there are many uh, postulated mechanisms of resistance. This was just things that we had put together in terms of hypotheses of why patients become resistant to targeted therapy. These are just that. They're just hypotheses based on preclinical data, uh, based on some clinical data, a lot of it, uh, frankly, not in kidney cancer. Uh, but you can see, as you all well know, that you know, the fundamental biology of VHL inactivation driving HIF overexpression uh, driving VEGF expression uh, remains, uh, is an early event in kidney cancer and really persists throughout the course of treatment. Here's some uh, preclinical data. Um, this is a slide that I've shown a lot. Um, uh, kidney cancer remains vascular after resistance in this animal model. Uh, this is uh, also uh, from Mike Atkins, and this shows a rodent model um, with uh, an RCC tumor subcutaneously and looking at different ways of measuring the vasculature either from arterial spin labeling MRI, which, where the brightness just shows the blood vessel flow, to immunohistochemical staining showing the actual blood vessels. And you can see on this model, and the reason I like this slide, is that it, it, it shows what we see in clinic on CT scans. It shows tumors getting smaller and less vascular, but then over time becoming larger and more vascular. But they're still vascular. We can argue that the reliance on VEGF is, is less dependent, but I don't think that this represents a VEGF independent state. Here's more uh, data from the same model showing that serafinib-resistant uh, tumors remain sensitive to giving serafinib again. What was done is that uh, inoculation of an animal model with 7860 renal cells, you get a period of stability on serafinib. When they grow, they're then extracted and re-implanted into a previously untreated mouse, and they demonstrate some degree of resensitivity to the same exact drug given in the same exact dose and schedule. So fundamentally, they remain reliant on the VEGF pathway, and therefore a veg VEGF inhibitor has uh, persistent and repeated effects. These are clinical data now from the Sunitinib Re-Challenge, which was a retrospective experience from many institutions, uh, been published a couple years ago now. These were patients who had been on sunitinib at one point, often on other VEGF inhibitors, had come off for progression, went on to other things, and then were re-challenged with sunitinib. Same drug, same dose, same schedule, sort of down the line from their initial sunitinib therapy. And you can see that the response rate and the PFS are actually quite impressive. Again, it's a very selected group, and it's retrospective. So with all the caveats of, of those criteria, uh, it still shows that the same drug can have anti-tumor effects in this setting. So the disease didn't change. It didn't fundamentally change to a different pathway. It remained sensitive to VEGF uh, inhibition, even the exact same drug given many months to years later. Here's the AXIS study, which is the only um, prospective level one evidence in the second line setting. I think you're all familiar with this. These were clear cell uh, patients who had resist defined PD after one and only one prior therapy. So it was a pure second line setting. You can see the treatments that they, that they received there, um, and those were the treatments that were approved at the time of trial design. Patients were stratified by performance status and which type of prior treatment they received, and randomized to receive either axitinib at, at a starting dose of five milligrams twice daily with an option for titration up or down, or a standard dose and schedule of serafinib. Uh, here's the main result, which has been presented and published, which was a uh, significant progression-free survival advantage to axitinib in this setting with a hazard ratio of 0 0.665 and a two-month uh, median progression-free survival advantage by uh, independent review assessment. 
Here's the PFS and subgroups uh, with the caveats of, uh, of subgroup analyses. You can see the cytokine pretreated was about a third of patients and the sunitinib pretreated was about half of patients. So these are rather large subgroups and I think can at least uh, form some strong hypotheses about the effects of, of this drug in that setting. Obviously sunitinib being a more common pretreatment setting uh, now. And you can see, although the medians are different, there's still a significant advantage to axitinib in this setting over serafinib with the hazard ratios you see there and significant p-values. Here's the Everlimus phase three study, the record one study, which is the, the other drug that's approved in a refractory setting. You're all familiar with this trial. I think really what I meant to point out on this slide is that this was largely a third line trial. So only 21% of patients were second line, 79% had received at least two or more prior therapies. So they were at least third line and, and often fourth or, or greater line. And you can see that by the percentages of prior treatments received uh, that patients had to receive either sunitinib or serafinib, but many had received both and many had received other treatments. I'll just go to the next slide. So, um, of course, we're not supposed to compare across trials, but we all do. So here's my cross-trial comparison looking in a refractory kidney cancer setting with the main drugs that have been uh, studied in prospective randomized trials. And what you can see here, the way that I look at these data, is that we've had an incremental gain over time in what we're able to do for these patients. So here's the median PFS in, in all comers in just treatment refractory kidney cancer. Um, if you don't treat people or you give them placebo, they get worse pretty much by the next scan, about 1.9 months. If you treat them with either a weak VEGF inhibitor or an mTOR inhibitor, you get uh, not quite five months of disease control and axitinib in that setting, in my opinion, clearly superior with not quite seven months of disease control. Thank you. Here's looking at the sunitinib refractory subset from each trial. So again, you start to compare subsets across trials and you're really in trouble, but I'll do it anyway. So uh, this is, the, again, the median PFS, and it really shows you the same kind of story that in placebo patients pretty much get worse at their first scan. You see some effect you know, to that next scan with serafinib or everolimus, and you see the most effect with a median of 4.8 months in the exitinib treated second line population. And then lastly, just looking at the same kind of analysis uh, for objective response rates, which, which which I think we can argue may be a bit more important in a second line setting when patients by definition have a higher tumor burden are probably a bit more likely to be symptomatic. The rates of tumor shrinkage might be a little more important in this setting than in a front line setting in my opinion. So of course placebo patients don't, ref re don't respond, a minimal response rate with Everolimus, a bit of a response rate with serafinib 9% and then axitinib uh, at a 19% objective response rate in this setting. The next slide please. So how do you pick second line therapy? So um, to date and, and still, it's really an empiric sequence of therapies. You have to look at the best available data, look at the biology of the disease and pick the drug appropriately. So these are data we presented at the last uh, ASCO GU symposium looking at prior objective response to sunitinib and did that predict subsequent axitinib progression-free survival? What you can see is that it did not. Remember the overall median was 4.8 months, really uh, no difference between responders and non-responders. So somewhat disappointingly, how patients did on their initial therapy, uh, at least in this one analysis, really had nothing, to do, nothing with how they uh, did on their subsequent therapy. Same kind of analysis, but now looking at duration of prior sunitinib. Previous slide was objective response, this is duration. And again, um, you get down into small subsets with very large confidence intervals. At nine months, you may start to see some separation here. You know that patients who are on more than nine months have a longer PFS on subsequent axitinib, but I would point out the confidence intervals here which are, are wildly overlapping. So again, I don't think we have good um, rationale to pick a second therapy based on how patients did on their first therapy. And I know Camilo is going to talk about this, but these are some data um, from Danny Hang's database that one of my fellows put together, uh, presented as a, at a, as a poster at ASCO last year looking at that same sort of question but in a broader sort of uh, a database and retrospective setting. Uh, these were patients who had uh, two lines of VEGF therapy, a front line and then a second line, segregated into how they did on their first line therapy. Did they have an objective response, stable disease or progressive disease? And then looking at their objective response to second line therapy, and you can see somewhat disappointingly and to me surprisingly that there's really no difference in objective response rate. Even patients who were primary progressive on their first therapy had an 11% response rate to second line VEGF therapy. Next slide. 
And this is just the same data set looking at progression-free survival, and you can see it's basically a scatter plot showing that there's really no correlation between frontline VEGF PFS and second-line uh, VEGF PFS. And then lastly, when I look at the Everolimus data, um, this is a recent publication that came out um, this year, actually, um, kind of looking at the breakdown of not only risk category but number of prior therapies. As I mentioned, the, the number of prior therapies in this trial was not consistent. W when I look at these data, what I see is, is an absolutely identical hazard ratio, which tells me that the benefit of this drug really doesn't differ based on the number of previous treatments, or for that matter, based on memorial risk, notwithstanding the very small number of poor risk patients uh, in this trial. So again, it, it, it has some benefit, but it doesn't matter whether you wait until third or fourth line because, again, the hazard ratio is the same. That's the way the trial was done, and so that makes sense. So in conclusion, kidney cancer has a biologic addiction to the VEGF pathway based on VHL mutation. It persists through initial therapy, making the highly potent and selective VEGF receptor inhibitor axitinib a rational choice. Uh, Exitinib is the only agent with prospective data in a pure second-line setting and provides thus the only level one evidence of clinical benefit in this setting. Provides a consistent and statistically significant benefit across subgroups uh, based on type of prior treatment. And the clinical benefit of Everolimus, I believe, is limited and does not appear to diminish when used as it was in the registration trial as third-line or later therapy. So, of course, the way to settle this question would be a trial like this, taking progressive clear cell patients and randomizing to them to exitinib or Everolimus. I've designed such a trial, which after Dr. Eisen I call the ARS study. Exitinib by Rini squashes Everolimus by Eisen. <laughs> and, of course, I think the one point that Tim and I probably will uh, both agree on in this session is what we really need is biomarkers to identify that subset of mTOR responsive patients who should be treated with mTOR and then the other subset of more VEGF responsive patients. We don't have those data yet, but hopefully in the future. Thank you for your attention.